Welcome to the Academy of Natural Sciences and our celebration of the Delaware River being named River of the Year by American Rivers. Uh, before we get started with our event, I'm going to go through a little tutorial for how we will be using Zoom for this event. To ask questions, uh, you can type your question into the chat function of Zoom, or you can use the raise hand function. To access the chat window and type your question, click the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If you type your question into the chat window, the moderators will ask the question on your behalf. To digitally raise your hand, click on the icon labeled participants at the bottom of the screen. A window will appear with a button labeled raise hand. If you click this button, the moderators will indicate when you can ask your question and will unmute your microphone. During the panel discussion, we would prefer for questions to be typed into the chat and a moderator will either answer your question in the chat or will ask the presenter to answer your question. Once we enter the Q&A portion, um, we will encourage everybody to use the raise hand function to ask the questions. And if you're enjoying this event on your mobile device, the screen might look a little different. It might look like one of these. You will still be able to find the raise hand function in the participants tab. I would now like to introduce Carol Collier. Carol is the Academy's Senior Advisor of Watershed Management and Policy and will be opening our event uh, with a few words and then introducing our panelists. Carol, we'll kick Hello, this over everyone. to you. Great that you're here to join us to celebrate the Delaware. You know, I've had the pleasure of working in the Delaware Basin for a number of decades now, and it's just an incredible resource. And I want to thank American Rivers for recognizing the Delaware as a nat national success story. You know, back in 2010, American Rivers had listed the Upper Delaware as one of the most endangered rivers, uh, primarily due to threats from the potential for natural gas well drilling and also the need for better flood management after those three big storms we had a few years before that. It's really nice to be off that list and now the river of the year. Um, even though federal dollars received for restoration is nowhere close to that poured into the Chesapeake, the river is getting recognition. We have the Delaware River Basin Conservation Act managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with a nice grant program and a coalition of nonprofit partners. But we need to stay vigilant. While it has improved greatly, the job is not over. There are still legacy issues that need to be addressed as well as new threats, the biggest being climate change. So let's talk about the river, our backyard resource. You know, it's 330 miles long, starting in the Catskills of New York, joining the ocean between Cape May, New Jersey and Lewis, Delaware. And it's watershed, that's the area of land draining to any of the tributaries or the, or the river, is over 13,500 square miles. But before I continue, I think this is a chance for our first quiz question. <laughs> okay, so our first poll question has popped up on the screen. Thank you to everybody who's, who's answering away. We would love to know if your tap water comes from the Delaware River. What do you guys think? We have some good questions going in here, some good answers. All right, so here are our poll results. 52% uh, of you know that or think that your water comes from the Delaware River. 28% uh, say no, it doesn't. And some of you are not sure. I, I think that's pretty reasonable. Carol, tell us more. Well, it's, a, it's sort of a trick question because we're saying the Delaware River, not the basin. And for instance, if you live in Philadelphia, 60% of the Philadelphia water comes from the Delaware, mostly the eastern side of Philadelphia, and more of the western side comes from two intakes on the Schuylkill River. Of course, the Schuylkill River is the largest tributary to the Delaware. You may be also drinking it if you're up in the Trenton area, 
or if you're from New York City, because New York City gets half its drinking water from the very headwaters of the Delaware. And the Delaware provides water to 13 to 15 million people. It's pretty incredible. But you know, providing, besides being a water source and having the largest freshwater port in the world, if you add together Philadelphia, Wilmington, Camden, et cetera, it's an incredible recreational resource. And it's, has, it's the longest undammed river east of the Mississippi. I mean, it's just incredible that we have this resource in this megalopolis area, right in our backyard. It's such a recreational opportunity. You know, it's interesting because people see the river differently depending on where they're from and how they use it. When I think about the headwaters, I think about trout fishing. And if people from Montana come to the Delaware to fish, it's such a resource. And you'll find uh, canoes and kayaks and tubing you know, through the whole non-tidal, the free-flowing river, down through the working river where we are in Philadelphia, all the way out into the bay. And the potential for recreation can only increase as the water becomes cleaner and river access points uh, are increased. So how did we get to this point of improvement? You know, it's, today it's as we wander down by Penn's Landing or other parts of the river, it's hard to imagine how polluted this river was. I mean, it smelled, it was a cesspool through the 1900s, even up to the 1960s and 70s. But it started with planning and regulation of point sources. Those are the pipes that go into the river. Think uh, uh, sewer discharges, industrial discharges. It was started first by the Delaware River Basin Commission in the 60s. And then after the Clean Water Act was uh, created, uh, actions by the federal governments and the states uh, followed. Uh, this is, you know, top-down regulatory action, and we still need that action. There's still a lot to do. We need to be vigilant. But as point sources were better controlled, we realized that there were other problems, specifically non-point problems. Think of this as the runoff from farms, runoff from suburban developments, urban streets. How do we also, how do we protect the forests that we know are so important to high water quality when most of the forests in the Delaware Basin are privately owned. Well, uh, that needed a different approach, a real bottom-up approach, working with farmers, landowners, municipalities. And this is where the Delaware River Watershed Initiative comes in. This initiative was kick-started by the William Penn Foundation in 2014 and involves 60 organizations think watershed associations, land trusts, national resource organizations, et cetera. We're now in the seventh year of action and it's having an impact. The Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University is the science lead for this initiative. And today you will hear from three of the top scientists involved with this extraordinary effort. Our first speaker will be Stephanie Kroll, PhD, watershed ecologist section leader an assistant research professor at Drexel. Um, she is the project director, science director for the initiative. Her research focuses is aquatic ecosystems, specifically related to restorative ecology and, and agricultural land use, different ways of using macroinvertebrates as indicators, and the interaction between aquatic communities, anthropogenic stressors, and climate. We'll then hear from Dr. Marie Kurz. She's a senior scientist and biogeochemistry section leader and also an assistant research professor. She is interested in the interactions between water chemistry and ecology in streams and rivers. Her research focuses on how aquatic ecosystems alter the fate of chemicals and contaminants, the impact of human activities on these processes and supporting effective science-based management for our water resources. And our anchor person will be Lynn Perez, who is head of the Environmental Data Science section. Lynn Perez is an environmental scientist and software engineer, and uh, she's in the Patrick Center. She builds novel tools for scientists and project partners to analyze, map, and visualize data, and has been responsible for many of the modeling tools currently used in the Delaware Watershed Initiative. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I don't know who Pam Jones is, but I love your cake um, picture there. <laughs> um, so I just want to give a talk about my work. There you are. <laughs> I do know you, Pam Jones. All right. Um, we are doing a lot of really interesting work as scientists and just even as residents um, in the basin. So I'm just going to share my screen and show you a couple of slides um, on that. Um, can you see the slide? Okay. Um, so the actions that Carol was talking about as far as what has been done in the basin um, these are some of them, but not all of them. And these are the ones that our work has centered around. Um, runoff from development um, is being addressed with stormwater best management practices. And perhaps you've heard of the Green Cities Clean Water Initiative, which is the largest one and most unique one like it in the country and maybe the world. Um, and a lot of those activities are also going on in our Delaware River Watershed Initiative. We are also, um, working with a lot of people who are addressing agricultural runoff by putting in best management practices of keeping cows out of the stream and reducing the amount of fertilizer and putting more streamlined irrigation in, for example. And then part of that also is floodplain restoration, um, especially putting in trees along creeks. Uh, that really helps buffer anything that's flowing across the land coming into the stream. Those trees just soak it right up like a sponge. So what I am really interested in is how can we show or do we know if restoration is really working? And so we do this with a multidisciplinary group of scientists and we really want to know, you know, this is a picture of a diatom, this sort of circle-y thing, which is a photosynthetic um, single-celled algae. And then these are my passion, macroinvertebrates are insects and other things that live in the water. Um, and then fish, of course, we all can identify easily. So restoration of streams and other ecosystems, um, it's still, a, there's still a lot of questions to answer as far as how long does it take an ecosystem to recover? Some wetlands have recovered in 10 or 20 years. Um, some places are still you know, um, adjusting after restoration. So we want to know about the time scale and about the scale on which you have to do the work on the land for that to affect water quality in a positive way. So we use multiple indicators and work as these teams um, to look at the effects of these stressors, which are nutrients and other pollution and storm water and just other things going on in the watersheds, you know, dams and point sources, we use all of these indicators to look at those things. And so that is what I am a nerd about from the day to day is uh, how do I solve this mystery of showing that there has been change and which of these indicators best show that change over time and over space. Um, we also get to work closely with a lot of partners from different areas. Carol mentioned this as well. So these are our monitoring sites across the areas where we're working in the Delaware Basin through the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. And then um, there's a long list, don't read them all here, but in each of these geographies, we have a long list of partners that are doing community science, that are um, collecting water and bugs in their creeks and sending them in for scientists to identify, and that are trying to share that information with the people they work with. And so we scientists like graphs and weird statistics and things that aren't too meaningful to people, but we want our information to help them understand their watershed and how the restoration is working and the progress that's being made. So we um, have available on our website, a lot of these publications and things that show the status of the streams where we're seeing this work being put on the ground either for stormwater um, or for agricultural purposes or for land preservation so that lands don't get further degraded and they don't get developed. And so you can check those out um, if you'd like. And I also just really want to acknowledge this amazing team of people that 
work at the academy with us. And um, it's, it's a really collective effort. And I know I'm even missing people here and everyone just cares a lot and knows so much and every day like puts in their best to help us answer these tricky but really important questions. Um, so that is all I wanted to share with you. And I think that there is a, another poll coming up right now. We do, we have another question for everybody. Um, Katie, do you wanna launch this one? Question is coming up shortly. Okay, how many states does everybody think have a part of the Delaware River watershed or touch the Delaware River watershed? Log your, log your answers now, could be sneaky. I see some counting going on here. <laughs> David Belinsky, I don't think that you should be counting on your fingers. I think you should know the answer to this one. <laughs> All right. So it's good, guys. You did really well. All right. So it looks like five is the uh, most common answer. And I believe you guys are correct. You guys are correct. Marie, uh, do you want to say a little bit more as you start your your part? Sure, yeah. The trick one on here for those of you that answered four is Maryland, which barely, barely touches the very edge of the Delaware River watershed, but technically is one of the states um, within the watershed. So that is our, that was our slight trick on this particular question as well, not intentionally. So let me go ahead and minimize this. So hi, everyone. Thank you um, for coming and joining us today. So I am a geochemist, so that's where I come from, sort of the whole lens of the science in the Delaware watershed. Um, and so I thought I'd talk about just a little bit some of the, um, some of the things that as a chemist, when I look at the Delaware River that um, are either my concerns, but also um, the things that we're really doing to, to improve the, the river watershed and what we have still to do. Um, so from a chemistry pollution or a perspective, it's all about human activities, everything, we do tends to have more often than not a negative influence on water quality and chemistry. And so the biggest one of these is always pollution. Um, what are the chemicals and the other things that we use in our daily lives that somehow get into um, the Delaware River or the watershed? Um, and how is that negatively or positively, but usually negatively influence that water? Um, so we're concerned with a lot of different types of pollution. We think about things like point sources where you know, you know exactly what pollution is coming in where. The classic example of this is a wastewater treatment plant. So they, most wastewater treatment plants, they, after they're finished treating the water, it's clean, but not natural, you know, not as clean as natural fresh water would be, but that gets dumped back into a river or stream almost always. But we know exactly how much is there, what they're putting in, the chemistry of what they're putting in, where it goes in. Um, and so it's a lot easier to see these point sources measure what's happening and the impact they have on the stream. Um, and for this reason, they're often highly regulated as well, which is good. Somebody's watching out, especially the government. Um, where it gets tricky is where you have pollution that comes from what we say non-point sources. So sources that are hard to really put your finger down and say, aha, there it is. So these are things like agriculture. So we spread nutrients, um, also pesticides and herbicides on our fields. Some of that gets taken up by the plants and utilized, but the excess runs off gets caught up in water during a storm, soaks into the groundwater, and eventually makes its way into the streams where those nutrients, pesticides, and herbicides aren't supposed to be and tend to create um, some trouble. There's also things like um, industrial contaminants. So one that we hear a lot about these days are PFAS, these uh, fire flame retardants um, that have gotten into the groundwater and are slowly making their way into streams and rivers causing problems both for the ecosystem, but also for humans, because these have an, a number of human health impacts as well. And the really silent but serious one that's growing increasingly and thankfully getting a lot more attention is road salts. Um, we use road salt very generously in the winter in this country. Um, and salt, when it makes it into the watershed, um, can have direct toxicological effects on the organisms there, but also adding that much chemical element, salt, sodium, and chloride usually, um, can really alter the chemistry of watersheds and the number of chemical reactions that are happening. And these have had a lot of sort of carry on effects. So that's just from a chemistry side. There's also so many other things that we do that affect um, chemistry. And once it affects chemistry it has the potential to affect ecology as well. Um, things like um, urbanization, 
So as we build cities, we don't just change the chemistry, we also change where water flows. Um, if we shunt it off into storm water and things like this, increases um, how much water flows off the land, increases how much erosion that water can do, um, which for example, adds a ton of sediment to streams, which can smother, smother the organisms in the stream, fills up dams, um, and then that water, if it flows too fast off, can't soak into our groundwater, which is where our groundwater is sort of what's the basis of most streams and rivers. It's that underground water source that slowly sort of bleeds water back out into the stream so that we have water in the summer, even though it's not raining. And of course, climate change. I think Steph and Carol both briefly touched on that one. And this one is really a wicked problem. There's so many ways that climate change affects river systems. Um, and this is why we're still really trying to figure out all these different interactions and what it can do and how we can try and solve that problem, either as a, a large scale solution or trying to find small solutions that can work here. Things like one of the biggest ones I'm always concerned about is sea level rise. The Delaware is a tidal river. Um, and so how far up, the more sea level rises, the more salt water pushes up into the river, which is important, um, especially for our drinking water because the salt water line is not a whole lot farther downstream than our drinking water intakes. Um, changes in weather patterns, increasing temperature, all these are problems too. So as Steph mentioned with DRWI, our biggest focus is on these sort of non-point sources, basically trying to fill in where regulations and government are having a harder trouble time acting and trying to focus on both what is the problem and then once you understand a problem, what we can do to solve it. Um, and so a big thing that we're doing is looking at agriculture, trying to figure out all these, you know, when you have all these different contaminants, sediment, all these different issues coming together, we call this multiple stressors, Steph mentioned this. And what does that, what it is, how can we disentangle all these problems that are hitting a watershed and figure out which ones are the really key ones and what different actions we can take to try and reverse those problems. Um, this is obviously has a clear tie in when you look at the chemistry. Um, we work, I work closely with Steph to try and figure out once you understand the chemistry, what does that mean for the biology? And then we have the bigger problem of how do we track everything that's going on, all the data we're gathering, make some sort of grand synthesis of that, and how do we share that information and data? Um, and that is where Lynn very much comes involved um, with her group and the data science group trying to help us um, you know, make sense of a lot of what we're doing. So I think with that, I will pass it back over to Lynn, and then I look forward to hearing some of your questions later on. Thanks so much, Marie. Lynn, are you ready? Uh oh, did we lose Lynn? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Hey, Lynn. Wonderful. Give me one second here. I'm uh, just looking for my my Zoom controls, which just disappear sometimes. Sneaky. Yes, they are. Do we have a poll question we want to pop up? Ooh, yeah, let's do that. ask a poll question <laughs> while you get set up. No, that's very helpful. I had a little pre-warning on that one. I know we have a fun one. So here's one is a, uh, proposed by Carol Collier that we all found quite fascinating. And is what city was formerly known as the caviar capital of the US? Was that Baltimore, Cape May, New York City, or Philadelphia? We all love our caviar and who used to be the capital mm. of that? This is an exciting question. We're getting, we're getting some Maybe very diverse we'll answers here. Yeah, I'll give Carol a heads up. Carol, do you want to? Sure. help answer this one or explain this one or finish. Okay, we'll give it like a couple more seconds here for people people to Philadelphia vote, their vote. There we go. Philadelphia is the winner with 42% of the results. Carol, did we get it right? You did get it right. You know, we're very excited now because sturgeon are coming back in the river and spawning in the river. But back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, we were, Philadelphia was the caviar capital of the world because of the incredible sturgeon population uh, plowing up and down the river. So, uh, maybe we can get back there, let's hope. Right. 
Lynn, you're ready to take it away now? Yeah, I apologize. I'm actually having a technical issue, unfortunately. Um, oh, no. But I, I, I'd like to show my screen and I am not sure that I can. There, there you are. If you, you can have, see me? Actually, oh, go ahead, Lynn. I cannot see you at the moment. I do have a great question here, though, um, from something Marie uh, mentioned with the salt. Um, Trisha would like to know, is anything being done to make winter road salting more environmentally friendly? Absolutely. So a lot of it is just making people aware of the problem. And I noticed Julie Slavitt is on the call here and her group in particular in working in Philadelphia at the Tukini Katoni Watershed Association has done some really great outreach to try and help people understand that salt is a problem. Often it's just, we don't think about a lot of our activities because they're so habit. Um, and so understanding what the issue is and knowing that salt is a problem hopefully encourages you to be a little less generous next time you spread out some salt on the sidewalk or your road. There are also alternatives. So different chemicals we can use or just avoiding salt altogether. Um, Europe, for example, doesn't use salt. They use gravel instead. Um, there's pros and cons, but um, especially from a chemistry perspective, even just trying to avoid it completely um, can be quite effective. So yeah, lots going on. And I'm sure we can share some resources about that at the end if you guys are interested in learning more. We have a, another really good question here um, in, in the chat while, while Lynn is getting situated. Um, from John Smith, how are several, how are the several abutting states uh, getting along in their sharing of the river? Um, so, so many states sharing one river, how, how are we managing that? Maybe I can take that one. Um, I, I used to head up the Delaware River Basin Commission and the, the commission was formed, um, the, the commi five commissioners are the governors of the four states. Unfortunately, Maryland is not a part of that but it's New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, and a representative of the president who is a general in the Corps of Engineers. And the whole idea is to manage the resource on a watershed boundary instead of a state boundary. As you may realize that the river itself forms the divide between all the states. When you're standing on the banks of the Delaware, you're always looking at a different state. And it's, it varies through time, as you might imagine, um, but at least we have this organization that is not above the states, but is a way to pull the states together to manage the resource. And it's really important because, for instance, in Philadelphia, all the water flows downstream. And as I mentioned before, 60% of our water comes from the Delaware, but we're like 200 miles downstream from the headwaters where New York City gets its water. So there's a lot of things that need to be managed on a basin perspective. And that's the role of the VRBC. Hope that helps. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, let's see if we have some more questions in here. We do have one from John. Um, can you speak a bit about how prescription drugs are filtered out at waste treatment facilities? And is there room for improvement? Yeah, I can take that one. So this is a bit of a tricky question. I don't know all of the details, but um, not all drugs are filtered out of wastewater, only some. Um, and so absolutely there is room for improvement. Wastewater treatment would actually probably removes a lot less than most people appreciate. Um, we think, I also, I myself used to think that it's like, oh, well, by the time it's treated, it's back to sort of clean, drinkable water, right? Nowhere close. Uh, there's a lot that goes through. Um, a lot of prescription drugs, so even in the, the effluent, what we let out of the wastewater treatment plant and into streams and rivers has very high um, concentrations of caffeine, antidepressants, and a number of other um, really common prescription drugs. Also, a lot of household chemicals make it straight through as well. Um, and so wastewater treatment plant is not the solution to sort of cleaning up after ourselves. It helps, but the biggest thing we can do is to keep prescription drugs and other chemicals from even getting into our wastewater in the first place. Um, and so 
The second solution, there are improved technologies that we're not using in wastewater, mainly because they're really expensive. And so next time your wastewater sewage bill goes up, think about some of the reason might be because they're trying to put in um, new technologies, which cost more, but in the end will benefit all of us if it keeps stuff out of the rivers. Let's see, Actually, should I keep going? I see another, some I have another great question here, but before I do, I do wanna see if Lynn is ready to go. Definitely, and we'll come back to these for certain. Okay, I'm not hearing from Lynn. So um, the other question I received, um, also from Trisha, another great question. Um, what can we do to get industry lawmakers and uh, on board with uh, taking our environment more seriously? Carol, Steph, you wanna take a crack at that one? Let, let me try. So it, it's a really interesting question. And one, that's why back in the 70s, it started with a sort of top-down regulation of point sources because um, industry, you know, was just putting sewage out in the river with no, no treatment at all. Um, I think it's changed since then because now there's, there's such a knowledge, public knowledge of water quality. And that if you're a stockholder in a company, you're looking at what that company is doing. So it's not just a regulatory driver, it's a stakeholder driver and a stockholder driver. And I think industries, um, there's peer pressure. You know, they, they don't want to be known as a dirty industry. So at least the, you know, the top tier always wants to stay above regulation, better than regulation. And there's always the lowest denominator that you got to push along. But um, for the most part, I think they're, they're making a much better effort and are part of the team. It looks like Lynn is starting to finally have some solving some technical issues. Fantastic. Yay. Are folks with me? Yes. yes. Yay, we can see. Awesome. So sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to just kind of build upon what Marie had, um, what, what Marie was talking about in particular. Um, the, the bulk of the work that I do in um, the context of the Delaware River Watershed Initiative is um, I, I take leverage or I take data that's that's um, generated by um, our project partners who are doing work on the ground, um, our senior scientists that we have at the academy, and I try to leverage that data into decision support tools um, that help inform future investments, um, but also quantify the impact of the collective work that's happening on the ground. Um, as Marie mentioned before, there are a series of targeted stressor, stressors that we are trying to kind of ameliorate within the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. The, the bulk of those stressors um, are focused around agricultural runoff, stormwater runoff, forest fragmentation, or loss in headwaters in particular, and then aquifer depletion. And that's specific to uh, the lower half of um, New Jersey. The bulk of how this information is translated in the context of, of the work that that I do and the work that my colleagues do at the, at the Academy is really focused around using web-based tools to allow quick turnaround to, to, for folks to access this data. I'm going to talk about one tool um, first and if we have time, I'll jump into the second. The first tool that I'm going to talk about is the Stream Reach Assessment Tool or what we call SRAP for short. Um, this tool um, was built primarily to allow stakeholders to uh, drill down into an area of interest within the Delaware River watershed and understand what the um, what the local issues are, and that's specific to um, agriculture, um, urban urban runoff, um, and the tool is pretty neat in that it allows users to understand um, the issues that are relevant to the Delaware River watershed initiative in particular, and that's nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment. Um, in particular. So a user can come into the interface um, and, and see specifically um, of, of those stressors that I talked about before, um, what are the kind of opportunities that they have um, access to that they could um, improve upon and then, and then are able to understand um, 
if they do a certain amount of work, how, how much work exactly would it take to move um, a water quality threshold from let's say a, a poor, um, a poor um, threshold that it's in now to, to a good or, or fair in the future. This work was done um, in collaboration with many organizations within the DRWI. And I, I have this slide here just to articulate um, how collaborative and interdisciplinary the, the work really is. So on this team, we have um, very technical watershed modelers, front end developers, data scientists, biogeochemists, facilitators, and then, and then a project lead from the Open Space Institute, Abigail Weinberg, who's um, a conservationist. This work was done um, collaboratively across about five institutions and it's just I kind of I, I believe it's, it speaks to like the, the nature of the, how the DRWI works as a whole. Um, this tool was really successful in um, directing the investments that were made um, in the last four years of the DRWI and I, I think that it what, what's most significant here is that um, what actually what we're looking at in the orange are our preliminary investment areas and by using tools like the stream reach assessment tool we're able to really directly um, kind of we're, we're able to direct the the work um, that we'd like to have on the ground and then quantify that work specific to what's happening in like aggregated watersheds watershed scales so this um this visual that we're looking at here we have the pink areas, which are the areas where the, our tools kind of directed the work to happen. And then that's in comparison to um, the orange areas where the work was happening before. And this, this created what was essentially a 69% reduction in the area that, um, in the area that, that, that investments are being made. From a, a quantification side of, side of things, it, it allows us to, to aggregate projects together and then actually see what um, the total in the total the total reductions are for the in-stream concentrations in nice in nitrogen phosphorus and sediment this project I would say was really successful for a number of different reasons but um, I'd say its success is not just in collaboration but also just kind of these five these five major areas we started off with engagement with stakeholders who are actively doing work on the ground so these are these are folks that are doing or specialize in preservation and restoration of agricultural land. Second, we made a, a concerted effort to understand what the need, what the need was of these practitioners. Um, and then the next step to that was really to, to under, understand or identify what's missing from their toolbox and, and what could we do to um, just to, to kind of address what the overarching collaborative questions are. So after we did that, we identified or established our existing resources um, that we had access to to tackle the question or problem at hand. And then we leveraged our resources across our institutions within the DRWI to create a tool. After that, I would say is the next or the next or the most important step, and that's enabling access and kind of transferring um, transferring transferring information across to stakeholders so that they could use it to to really achieve what their goals are in a geographic area of interest. And this was often um, in the form of like webinars or one-on-one um, -on -one meetings, et cetera. The success of the StreamReach assessment tool I, and, and really I, I think that the way that that project was done um, kind of speaks volumes to, the, to the, the way that we do work in the DRWI, but also um, the, the issues that we're dealing with locally in the Delaware River watershed are very similar to issues that we're dealing with on a national scale. And so the, the products and the approach that we, that we did for SRAT um, were, were then expanded to a national scale in, um, in a tool called Model My Watershed, which is done um, by the Stroud Water Research Center. And so this is just a quick snapshot of what the SRAT um, data set looks like inside of Model My Watershed, which is now available nationally. The next thing that I'm going to talk about is project aggregation and how we do it in the context of the DRWI. So we use two platforms to do this. The first is called FieldDoc. FieldDoc um, is essentially a software that we use to um, document really specific projects. 
and the um, best management practices that are being employed on the ground um, at like essentially on the parcel scale. And then the aggregation of all of that data happens in what in a tool that we call the um, DRWI dashboard. All of this work, um, these two, these two products in particular are a collaborative project that's done between um, Chesapeake Commons and the Academy of Natural Sciences. So just to quickly step through um, what our software does, it primarily tracks restoration and protection projects that are happening within the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. And it allows users or stakeholders to come in and um, create a project and manage that project um, inside of that platform. Next, um, on a, for every single project, a user can manage metrics, targets, and geographies for where they're doing their work. And um, the metrics specifically um, are, we're looking at um, acres of wetlands, acres where best management practice, practices are, are affecting um, the agricultural landscape, miles of, of river restored, et cetera. We then take all of that data and aggregate it in the DRWI dashboard. So all of the projects that are happening um, across 50 different organizations are aggregate are aggregated um, to really specific geographies that we um, study within the context of the DRWI. So project partner, partners come in to field doc and they enter in um, where specifically they're doing their work. Um, and that, that's usually on a, on a parcel scale. And then they're actually able to come in and um, enter exactly where and what kind of agri agricultural best management practice um, they're employing on a, on, on a given farm. On the back end, we are using really complex algorithms to, um, to determine this really specific amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reduced from every single one of these best management practices. As I was mentioning before, all of this data is then um, spun up into what we call the DRWI dashboard. This is a public interface, so everyone here is able to access this. It's at drwi-dashboard.org. And you're able to track um, the collective work that we're doing across all eight of the sub-watershed clusters that we were just talking about, but then also look into really specific public projects like, like what we're looking at right now. Um, and specific BMPs that take place on a given project of interest. So that's essentially all I was going to go over today. This is um, a lot of the work that, that my group and, and I work on are about aggregation and quantifying impact. Um, and then we really work with folks like Steph and Marie to help translate um, kind of the rich scientific um, narrative of that back out to our constituents. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Lynn. This was really, really great. And uh, thank you to Steph, who popped the, um, the website uh, in the chat for the DRWI dashboard. Um, so everybody can, can copy that link and go check out um, Lynn's awesome work uh, for themselves. Um, are we about ready to open up for a little Q&A? Caitlin, I think you are going to lead us through this. Absolutely. And before we dive in, I just want to circle back, Lynn, on one of the slides you shared, there was a little box that said Enviro DIY. And one of mm -hmm. the questions in our chat box was, are there sort of opportunities for community science uh, around this work? So is there any way that you could quickly touch on that before we move into the formal Q&A? Yeah, very much so. So that Enviro DIY, which you saw, I think, on the side panel of the Wiki Watershed um, tool suite, is a really neat um, it's, it's, it's really a like community science driven um, program headed up by the Stroud Water Research Center and all of the uh, many of the partners actually that we work with within the Del Delaware River Watershed Initiative um, participate in EnviroDIY. I think EnviroDIY specifically is focused around um, the use of um, motherboards um, and integrating motherboards with sensors so you can deploy um, 
you can, can basically you can basically deploy stream side in situ sensors to take continuous um, data points, usually typically with temperature, pH, specific conductivity, um, right, right, like directly at stream side. So you could find find out more about that at Enviro DIY. Um, but yeah, we are we do use the data that comes from Enviro DIY in some of. Um, um, Hi, this is Steph. I also wanted to say, but my dog is growling. Um, they, we have so many great partners. I only showed on the slide the ones who work with us in monitoring, but only, I mean, that was at least 30 organizations. So um, community science in the DRWI is really headed by watershed associations and groups mm -hmm. who are already doing that. For example, the Tukoni Tukoni Frankfurt Watershed Partnership or um, Wissahick and Trails formerly known as Wissick and Valley Watershed Association, um, Friends of the Poquessing and um, the Green Valleys Association. So we are really excited. If anybody is interested, um, we might be able to direct you to your local watershed association so you can get involved with community science. Awesome, thank you so much, Lynn and Steph. And as Andrea sort of showed us in the beginning, if you wanna click on your participants window and do your little raise hand function, we can start to sort of ask questions live, or we also have some questions in the chat box that we can also sort of get started with. Um, in the chat, I see that we have one from Fred. Um, do you know of any online impervious surface calculators to estimate the volume of runoff from a particular building? If either, any of you four panelists would like to answer that question? If you know of any or not. I can't think of any offhand, but there definitely are. Steph, can you, we can post this after the fact, maybe some of these resources. Yeah, I, I don't know offhand. Okay, great. I know actually, sorry, uh, Lynn is working on a dashboard for some of our data representation, and I'm not sure if that will be in it have an idea it might be um, maybe not from a particular building but just to get an idea yeah so this. we we um, have built one tool um, that has been integrated into field doc in particular that um, allows users to draw in an area of interest and then um, define specifically what kind of bmp or what we call a grain storm green stormwater infrastructure could be employed within a given area of interest and then show the reduction in nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment in that area of interest. So it's less specific to water volume and is more specific to um, reductions in, uh, it's really improving water quality. So it's, it's focused on reductions of pollutants. Awesome, thank you. It looks like Allison has raised her hand. So Allison, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and feel free to go ahead and ask your question. You are, should be unmuted now. Okay. Um, so I guess I have a couple questions, but I'm gonna wait my turn. Um, I think the first one will be that um, Marie Kerr's mentioned that there are possible positive impacts that humans can have on <laughs> the waterways in terms of chemicals is, I'm just kind of curious about that. Yes, I should say maybe positive in that we're trying to reverse the things that we've done badly. <laughs> so um, there are a few times when, yeah, we do interventions, but usually those interventions are trying to fix a problem that we created. So for example, um, well, conservation is the largest one, trying to you know reverse um, negative impacts, as well as, for example, when we have too much nitrogen, too many nutrients, often you get these green algae blooms. There's various chemical interventions for trying to reduce algae blooms, or algae blooms. But again, that's chemical interventions to fix a problem that we created in the first place. So um, actually it's true. I can't think of anything offhand that um, we do that has a positive impact um, where it improves upon the natural undisturbed system. So. Awesome, thank there. you, Marie. We've got one more question from John Smith. Um, accumulating sediment in the river has obviously affected navigation on the Delaware and the ability of ports along the river to compete with other ports along the Atlantic coast. Is there a working relationship between the DRWI and organizations like the Army Corps of Engineers? Um, so yeah, I guess I'll say the 
sediment, you know, it's a natural process that it get, gets deposited downstream. And our bay actually naturally flushes itself more than, for example, the Chesapeake or other similar bays. So, but it does still need to be dredged for navigation from time to time. Although um, the past few years, we've been um, accumulating less sediment than historically. And I believe that researchers are still looking into why that would be the case. Um, so for the DRWI, the funding is going to non-governmental organizations, but a lot, we all have relationships with a lot of different entities around. Um, we, the Academy has met a little bit um, over time with the Army Corps of Engineers, and we keep on each other's radar but um, we do have different missions in terms of maintaining navigation or um, water quality. So we're not working really closely with them. But yeah, we do stay in touch and um, share our work with each other in case there's opportunity for collaboration or even just sharing information. Yeah, I wanna follow up on that really quickly. Um, Carol mentioned that the Delaware is unique for being one of the longest undammed rivers and sediment really becomes an issue with dams since we don't have many dams on the Delaware, we don't have the big sediment issue either where sediment from upstream comes down and then settles behind dams. The Chesapeake has a really a big issue with this where their dams are essentially filling up with sediment instead of water. Um, so anything, any sediment we prevent upstream from coming downstream helps the issue. Um, but overall, that nat the more natural condition of the Delaware without dams allows it to sort of moderate its own sediment in a way that the Chesapeake with all its dams isn't able to do. Sorry, the Chesapeake, the Susquehanna, which flows into the Chesapeake. Fantastic. Thank you, Steph and Marie. We've got another question from Bonnie. Can you speak about the resurgence of oyster farming in the Delaware and its impact on the ecology that we find there? Uh, Carol, do you want to talk about this or do you want me to? Oh, I lost Carol, it. mute. Oh, you're muted. It's always the bane of all Zooms, whether you're muted or unmuted. <laughs> um, oysters are on a resurgence. You know, we lost a lot of oysters in the Delaware to different uh, predators and diseases, but oysters are really critical for water quality. They, they, um, filter so much water that not only do they taste good, but they're good for the ecological system. And so a lot of people are putting oysters back in bays uh, for the ecological reason, even if um, they're in areas that you, you can't eat them. Um, there, are, there are school programs where you can start small oysters in bags and the uh, elementary and middle schools will, will you know, take care of those. And then when they get bigger, the oystermen will take them out and, and put them on reefs. So people getting the ideas that, that they're good. The parallel to that in the freshwater part of the river is freshwater mussels. And these you can't eat, but they're very valuable for water quality. Also as an indicator of good water quality and cold water. And there's also major initiatives, both with the Academy, Partnership of Delaware Estuary and others to bring these mussels back or re, um, reinstate mussels where they had been before and actually start a mussel hatchery so we can grow mussels specifically for the Delaware and Susquehanna rivers. Pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and mussels and oysters both uh, really stabilize banks so they can help reduce erosion they also, in them, because of their shells, they provide habitat for very small fishes and other creatures, and the, the creatures eat them. So um, they have other effects on the well-being of the ecosystem in those ways as well. And mussels are some of the most endangered groups um, in the world. So any opportunity to restore them locally would be great. Excellent, thank you. We have another question from Allison. Um, in many cases, due to development and urbanization, it's not necessarily possible to restore waterways to the way they historically were. But if it were, how would that be identified and to what point? For example, if the sturgeon were common before the 20th century, they would still be affected by pre-industrial pollution, right? I know, Carol, if you want to touch on that a little bit. Um, I think you, you'll see that the sturgeon were here be before it really got bad with industry. That's when they really flourished. 
Um, and then as industry took over, that's when we lost the sturgeon population. We lost the shad population because there was no oxygen in the estuary. It was, uh, it was really like a brick wall for migratory fish. They couldn't get past Philadelphia and Camden area because the water quality was so poor. So now it's really exciting that we're seeing things like the sturgeon coming back, the shad improving, et cetera. Yeah, Allison's point is really interesting. It's conservation, you have to say, what are you trying to restore something to is sort of the golden question of all conservation. Um, the DRWI takes two approaches. We try and prevent future change. So for example, trying to protect those forested headwaters so that they stay forested, they stay natural, because then we don't have to debate what we're trying to put it back to. We just keep it the way it is now, um, where it's already good. And yeah, where, where it goes back to is always a compromise between what we can achieve, what the needs of, I mean, we are a society, we need to use the environment to some degree. Um, so we'll never, it's always going to be a compromise between what we can manage and what stressors and what changes we just have to learn to live with um, in that regard. So yeah, that's definitely a, a tricky question to answer. Definitely. So we have time for one more question before I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea to close us out. And that's from Bill. How will increasing salinity with the sea level rise affect the estuaries? Ooh, another good question. So sea level, um, increasing salinity. So yeah, we're in an estuary. So we have fresh water coming in, salt water coming up um, from the ocean. And currently there's sort of a balance where you get a gradient from fresh to salt. And within that gradient, there's different organisms um, that are sort of, well, their whole life cycle is, is tailored to that set salt gradient. Um, they may stay in one particular spot their whole life or they may move where they need fresh water as say juveniles, saltier water they can take as adults. So as sea level rise it changes where the salinity gradient is within the bay, it has the potential to certainly affect, maybe not negatively if they can move, but other organisms can't move. And so you can really disrupt that natural ecosystem. Um, so that's definitely one of the, the greatest inputs for the ecology. From the, our side, if, our, if the salt water gets so far up to our Philadelphia drinking water intakes, um, then we have a real problem of what we're going to do and it's going to cost a lot of money to fix whether you're trying to filter the salt out or we have to move our intakes. Um, so that's the big human concern over this rising salt line. And if I can add to that, the Delaware has some really unique tidal freshwater marshes. Do you think from Bristol area even down to um, Tinicum area? And as the salt line starts coming up, those will, will really be threatened. So there are a number of really critical issues. All right, we have one minute until 4.30 and I know that everybody has things to do, but it looks like Penelope has her hand raised. So we'll quickly get to you, Penelope. I'm about to unmute you. And then after your question is answered, we'll hand it over to Andrea to close us out. So Penelope, you should be unmuted. So um, how can we get the polluted water out of the clean water? That's an awesome question. So we have some really great technology that when we, at least for drinking water, when we withdraw drinking water from the Delaware and it's a little bit polluted, we have a lot of different technologies that can help clean the water so that it is safe to drink, try and get some of those contaminants out. Unfortunately, there's no way to do that for the entire Delaware so that all the fish and ecosystems that live there can benefit from cleaner water. So we either try and keep it clean in the first place, or the other thing is all these different conservations like planting trees on the banks, working with farmers so the cow manure doesn't go into the water. Um, we essentially try and, and reverse, um, keep the water clean. I guess that's really the biggest thing. Find natural processes that help instead of human technology um, and try and keep it clean in the first place so we don't have that problem at all. Um, and then we benefit because we drink cleaner water and also the environment benefits because it gets to enjoy the same clean water. And um, wetlands are natural. Oh, wetlands are natural filters and cleaners of water as well. So preserving our wetlands and our estuaries also helps clean the water even after it has gotten dirty, even by things like heavy metals. Uh, wetlands can really take up nutrients and other pollutants. Yeah, nature will fix itself if you give it enough time. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Penelope. That was a really, really great uh, final question. I appreciate that. Um, so thank you, Penelope. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you to our awesome panelists, Carol, Steph, Marie, and Len. You guys have been fantastic. Um, I also want to say thank you to everybody who uh, made a, a donation with your registration for this event. We really appreciate it, and it helps make work um, like that of, of our team here possible. Uh, so thank you for that. And before we go, I would like to raise a glass of very clean, drinkable Delaware sourced <laughs> water to celebrate the Delaware River being uh, announced as River of the Year. So Ooh. cheers to the Delaware and cheers to everybody's work keeping it cheers. clean. Mm.